Today's video has been sponsored by our partners at The Sojourn. You could get the complete Season 1 on Spotify at no extra cost if you have Spotify Premium, depending on region. But more regions are being added all the time, so it's worth checking if you can listen to the season. It contains all 12 episodes, including three brand new ones from Volume 4, of this critically acclaimed audio drama, featuring a full voice cast including Martin Roach from The Expanse and Ben Prendergast from God of War Ragnarok and Apex Legends. The season is now available on all the big servers including Audible, Nebula, Google Books and Apple Books, and many more. Every episode is also available on the lowest tier of the Patreon linked below, and higher tiers get access to amazing bonus content including the Visual Dictionary, a ship identification chart by Star Trek Online's Thomas Marone, a hugely detailed ship cross-section poster, and 10 anthology shorts. If you don't know what the Sojourn is, then head over to their YouTube channel for free samples as well as extra lore content and ship breakdowns. The Sojourn, the complete first season, out now. Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hojuana and today we're examining whether carriers in space make any sense. I won't touch on fighters since we did that twice already, so the main focus for this video will be how carriers launch and recover those fighters and whether they should get into direct combat with other ships. First, taking off from runways in space. We all know that's a daft idea, so I'm not going to harp on about it, but I will come back to landing on runways later on. Luckily, most sci-fi instead opts for generic launch bays, which make a bit more sense. They're seen in Star Trek, Star Wars, Stargate, and many more. They're easy to understand and work well, so have kind of become the default for the genre. The downside is that they open up gaps into the vulnerable internals of the ship, though there are ways of reducing the risk. Relying on shielding is the first one, either over the bay's entrance or the entire ship, but they're not a panacea though. Shields may not fit the setting or the narrative of the particular situation, so let's look at some other solutions, using Star Wars as an example. The Veneta class likes to hide its bays to occlude them from incoming fire. Its side ones are tucked into cutouts, and the main bays are either side of the big trench on the front, but with how incredibly long the gap here is, it's still a huge target for enemy fire. The classic Star Destroyer belly bays are similarly protected up in their little cutout, which isn't perfect but does limit the angles for seeing into the ship from outside. The real good part of the Venator's bays though are the chunky blast doors that cover them up when not in use, letting it launch its strike craft and armour up its most vulnerable parts before it gets into a shooting match. Its separatist counterpart, the Providence class, also has big blast doors protecting its main hangar bay, but the shield generators for these are fairly vulnerable from the exterior which doesn't make much sense. But to me, that gigantic through-deck hangar is poorly thought out. It's ridiculously exposed, and taking out the shield generator forces one side to close, reducing the effectiveness of the hangar. And what if that happened to both sides? The huge bay is now either shut off and therefore useless, or left open to vacuum and completely unprotected. Through deck hangers in general don't seem great to me. They're cool ideas, but they really expose the interior of the ship and the big hole requires some compromises to the ship's structure. That said, through decks and launch bays do have their upsides. They're great at protecting craft waiting in the staging area by being partially enclosed, and can even accept larger craft or connect to a stationary location. But that's not much of a benefit versus just using a regular docking port. An evolution of the through deck is the flight pods that battle stars are equipped with, being mounted alongside the main hull of the craft rather than poking a hole through it. In function, they are fairly different to the combined staging and launch bays we've already talked about, which is because Battlestar Galactica, at least the reboot, emulates real world carriers with its catapult launch and runway landings. But unlike real life, Galactica's catapults are not a part of the runway, instead connecting directly to the internal hangar, meaning the staging area is nice and safe and breathable. However, BSG combat landings are very much the same vibe as real carrier ones, despite Vipers more closely following proper spacecraft physics than fighters in most settings do. This is because these landings are meant to be fast. Landing craft may not necessarily have the time to properly match velocity, so they just rely on magnetic skids, or the generated gravity of the ship, I forget which, to get down ASAP. One thing I really like about this is Pegasus, with its double pods, one of which is upside down. A neat little reminder that yes, this is space, up means nothing. 
I have to bring up the weird landings in Call of Duty Infinite Warfare here for comparison, where fighters that can come to a stop on a dime even better than a Viper, instead fly in to land on a runway. Then a little drone grabs them to stop them bouncing off, and slows them down to park in a hangar. It feels like forcing atmospheric flight vibes on something that isn't that. Another type of sci-fi carrier that shows up is one that stores its fighters externally, ready to fleek off or pop out from a storage slot as with the Cylon Toastrax. The benefit of this method is it is by far the fastest method of deployment, making these ships very well suited to surprise attacks. This has its downsides though, starting with retrieval. How do Cylon Raiders return to their toast racks? I don't think they reverse in, it's more likely they land in the normal hangar bay to be repaired and rearmed, then loaded into the rack from the inside. Section 31's drones would have to be stacked back where they came from, leaving gaps if any were destroyed. Maintenance and repair would be difficult too, but I guess with transporters and replicators it can be done remotely? Maybe? Fighters in Trek are not really a proper thing, and these strange fighter drones fit into the franchise even less well than the few that already existed. The other downside of exterior storage is that any damage to the ship's exterior can also hit unlaunched fighters. Even routine wear and tear from being outside all the time will be a concern as space is a hazardous environment, so storing things inside simply saves on maintenance. A slower alternative that gets around this is having multiple fast launch bays like Viper Tubes, or the really neat Cobra Bays on Babylon 5 where the Star Furies just drop out thanks to the station's centrifugal force. The elephant in the room with any of these options, and why it matters if they're weak points or vulnerable to attack, is the insistence of sci-fi to have combined carrier battleships, like Battlestars with their guns and armour and vipers and raptors. Star Wars does it a lot too, and if we go back to our example with the Venator, we have to talk about the Marg Sable Maneuver. This is the completely crazy idea of rotating your ship to screen the main launch bay and the ship's fighters before engagement, where they all suddenly appear at once. This upending of the tired old naval warfare in space that Star Wars is addicted to is simultaneously refreshingly genius and mind-bogglingly stupid. Not a single soul would be surprised by the appearance of fighters from a carrier, but at least this is recognised in-universe by no one but the stupidest of droids falling for it. Stargate falls prey to this trope too, since it wants to have stories with big warships and fighter craft at the same time, but budget concerns and time constraints and genre momentum lead to a lot of do-everything craft across most factions. That doesn't stop the BC-304 being excellent though, does it? The huge Wraith Hive ships also have an interesting feature. Their enormous size lets them hide their dart launch bays internally. This puts a bit of distance between the exit entry point and the hangar itself to make it difficult to sneak weapons fire into the interior of the ship. The thing is, real carriers don't operate anything like the way most sci-fi ones tend to. They're not sent into battle to shoot guns at enemy vessels, and making a ship that can carry aircraft and get into slugging matches compromises its effectiveness at both. They need to specialise. Carriers have their aircraft to do the fighting for them, so at no point should a carrier be anywhere near an enemy surface vessel, unless things have gone terribly wrong. In fact, out of all the real carriers lost in combat, only two were solely due to gunfire. HMS Glorious was caught assisting in the evacuation of Norway by Scharnhorst and Neisenau, and USS Gambia Bay fell to heavy fire from multiple Japanese ships, including the Yamato, who snuck up on it in the night. For comparison, aircraft were either solely responsible for or played a significant role in the sinking of 21 carriers, with submarines claiming another 18. This shows that these ships are kept well away from gunfire, instead falling prey to long-range airstrikes or sneaky ambushes from below. Yes, all of these are World War II examples, but that's a significant source of inspiration for sci-fi carrier battleships anyway, since aircraft and especially missiles rendered battleships redundant after the war. So sci-fi rarely feels like it has pure carriers. It seems like it's more common to include a battlestar-like vessels to enable fights of both gun and dog varieties in the story. Settings want to have their cake and eat it too, though to be fair, there may be mitigating circumstances like I mentioned with Stargate. As for pure carriers, I'd be lying if I implied the genre was completely bereft of them, so here's some examples. Cylon base stars are pretty close, as their missile armament was meant for orbital bombardment. Legend of Galactic Heroes has both carriers and battleships. 
Star Wars has the Quasar Fire Class. EVE Online has its drone ships as well as actual carriers. I can't list them all though, so put your favourite and least favourite examples in the comments below. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon where you can get our Space Fighter design reference book. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by giving us super thanks or by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters and thank you for watching.